The Vodal Scorpion bears the mark of things to come, and for that I have a certain optimism, though it does come with a few caveats. On the surface, the Scorpion presents a strong combat aesthetic. Angled panels to deflect bullets, thick armor, strong shields, and an increase in mass that reflects the extra kick that the Scorpion was built to provide. You can really feel the extra weight on the Scorpion's chassis when driving. It feels planted, if a little slow under the pedal, but provides a reasonable amount of traction compared to the Scarab. In open planetary testing, I was able to coax 32 meters per second with full engine power and all pips directed to the engines, though it tended to top out at around 30 meters per second in most situations, and it required long flat stretches of terrain in order to build up the necessary momentum. At speed, the Scorpion is surprisingly stable, plowing over small rocks and wrinkles in terrain that would foul up the Scarab. That is, until it gets hung up on something in the terrain and stops dead. You'll find the limits with large rocks, or with excessively puckered terrain. The Scorpion will spin out in a similar manner to the Scarab, but the abundance of torque and traction mean the slide is shorter and stopping power almost instant. Pulling the handbrake stops the party faster than a clogged toilet. Even with drive assist off, getting off the accelerator is almost as effective as hitting the brakes, making it easy to avoid bad situations as to find them. The Scorpion also suffers from rear-end hop that shows up in rough terrain at speeds over 20 meters per second. It's worse in low-gravity environments, happens with little warning, and makes it steer like a bag of squirrels, typically resulting in a spin-out, or in extreme situations could lead to a rollover, though I never had that happen to me, even after hitting some pretty big stuff. Thankfully, rollover recovery won't be complicated in typical use cases. Cargo capacity is, somehow, two ton. I'm not sure where those canisters fit, but I won't complain about it, since the Scarab received two additional tons of cargo capacity for a total of four. This manages to shove the SRV Scarab more firmly into the utilitarian explorer role that it's always aspired to. Weapons are where things start to get interesting. Naming anything a repeater makes people think of a machine gun with extra steps, and that remains the case here. The Surge Repeater's gimmick is that it gets more accurate as fire rate increases, a trade-off likely designed because the individual projectiles are exceptionally strong. If this thing had the pinpoint accuracy of the Scarab's Plasma Repeater, broken as hell would be an understatement. Three total barrels take turns firing a single projectile at an increasing rate, with the shot spread tightening as fire rates increase. The spin-up time takes several seconds eating into the capacitor significantly before full speed is attained. Any interruption of the spooling process fully resets the weapon's fire rate down to its minimum setting, so burst fire is not a viable workaround here. The weapon demands sustained fire at full spin for its best use, so it burns through ammunition very quickly, making it poorly suited to protracted engagements without synthesis. The Aculus missile launcher is an equally strange weapon, but without any gimmick whatsoever. Don't let the understated design lull you into a false sense of security. This rocket is extremely powerful, and is currently the only missile launcher in the game that allows you to choose whether it's fired dumb as an arrow or with signature lock. Catch a ship with its shields down, and this little monster hurts, making the Scarab an effective deterrent against any skimmer, ship launch fighter, or even several of the small pad ships. Though you'll need to be careful about firing it, because you only get 13 shots. 12 in the magazine, plus 1 in the chamber. Yet again, synthesis will be necessary for protracted engagements. Vodal's marketing on this thing is somewhat deceptive, showing it raging around settlements wrecking everything in sight. But this isn't the full picture. Since the Scorpion has roughly the same wheelbase as the Scarab, it suffers from the same issues, getting stuck on local geometry, making tight corners between buildings, and doing the fine maneuvering necessary to traverse the confines of a settlement. Granted. The two-seat configuration means that the driver can focus on avoiding these obstacles while the gunner provides cover. Two seats gives the Scorpion superior tactical awareness when used with multi-crew. The extra armor and shields allow the Scorpion to draw and absorb more fire, but the limited jump jet capacity means that the Scorpion is more vulnerable to becoming permanently stuck on something, or in something, than the Scarab. The repeater suffers severely in settlements as a result of the massive amounts of jitter when firing at lower rates, where the hit spread is appalling. Infantry targets are too small to reliably hit outside of tire slashing range. 
It gets better the longer you fire, becoming much more dangerous as it spools up, but taking far too long to matter. Typical combat flow will push your vehicle around different firing lines, rarely offering the time on an individual infantry target necessary to secure a kill. Taking that time necessary to clean up a target requires the Scorpion to slow down, increasing its vulnerability to incoming fire and reducing your chances of a successful operation. I want to be clear that this isn't a complaint about design. It's a statement of role, and one I fear the marketing doesn't clarify enough. The Scorpion is not, I repeat, not a tool for dealing with infantry. It's a cudgel for smashing skimmers, scaring off fighters or small ships, and neutralizing stationary defenses. The repeater's appealing jitter spread actually helps it deal with fast-moving targets by reducing the need for player accuracy. Place a target generally inside the targeting reticle, then let jitter and the law of averages do all the work. The surge repeater makes simple what the plasma repeater does not, and a dedicated gunner means that one set of eyes stay skyward tracking targets, while the driver's eyes stay locked on the terrain. It's an excellent division of role and attention, and one which has been duplicated across countless real-world military vehicles since internal combustion was invented. The Scorpion shreds its smaller, lighter SRV counterpart in practical combat. Where the Scarab's plasma repeater lacks the damage necessary to crack the Scorpion's shields before it can retaliate, giving one fully manned Scorpion the ability to take on more than one Scarab and possibly win. The repeater's spread makes accuracy less important in Snap 2 situations, at the cost of making range control critical. Ship launch fighters are extremely vulnerable to the Aculus launcher, though it may take two or three shots to destroy a fully shielded one. Small ships should beware, the surge repeater hurts, and while most small vessels can resist initial attack, lingering within stinging range is a dangerous prospect, especially when challenging more than one of these vehicles. Though the Scorpion lacks the raw DPS necessary to stop something like a Vulture dropship from deploying its reinforcements. The Scorpion excels in Guardian Ruins, where the defense drones fold under combined missile and weapon barrages in seconds. The extra shield and hull armor makes the Scorpion much more forgiving, while the lower acceleration and tighter handling make positioning easier, especially when aided by a gunner. Though the Scorpion readily accepts and can be operated by a single crewman when necessary, though to less overall effectiveness. In either case, you will need to have synthesis or a fleet carrier available to resupply ammunition reserves for both weapons. It's clear that Frontier is starting to build out the combined arms aspect of Odyssey, though at the moment I find the Scorpion lacking a lot of practical use cases, since it requires multi-crew to realize its full potential. There are a lot of commanders who may pass on it until that gameplay becomes more developed. Since settlements are primarily defended by infantry, the Scorpion isn't the practical choice for solo commanders, who will likely favor the pinpoint accuracy and extended range of the Scarab's plasma repeater. Duos running missions together does allow one vehicle to manage the getaway where two would normally be needed, providing some interesting gameplay opportunities for two-seat multi-crew ships. The Scorpion's weakness to infantry and the Scarab's vulnerability to vehicles mean that the two platforms can work well together, filling each other's weak points in, and benefiting each other's major strengths. Full fire teams now have an exceptional spectrum for attacking large settlements. The Scorpion provides close fire support by scrubbing hardened defenses and destroying skimmers, while the Scarab hangs back, targeting exposed infantry and providing overwatch. In this scenario, the players in the Scorpion could then move in and raid a settlement for whatever objective suits their fancy, while the Scarab, Maintaining an overwatch position can warn of dropship reinforcements and clean up any stragglers that might spill out different buildings while the others do their work. The fourth man in a fire team can hang back in a ship for rapid pickup once an objective is completed, or provide air support if things get nasty, deterring dropships and engaging any interceptors guarding the airspace over a settlement while the ground game is played in earnest. On paper, this makes for an interesting proposition, though I'm curious how often this will actually happen. In all the years I've played Elite Dangerous, I've never felt a strong incentive to use multi-crew, or even to coordinate with other players outside of extremely high-level content. The multi-crew system, in general, is poorly incentivized by the game's current mechanics. Most missions found on a mission board are not shareable, so opportunities for shared gameplay are not reliable enough. Sure, you can make your own fun 
but if you happen across engineering or other material rewards, coordinating who gets what can be a sticking point, as can ensuring everyone gets paid fairly. Since the game continues to maintain an iron-fisted control over transactions outside of fleet carrier markets. Put simply, we really need a pay friend button and the ability to choose whether we pay in materials or credits in order to provide the emergent incentives needed for multi-crew to shine and not just in the ground game. Multi-crew issues aside, the specialization of the Scorpion makes me wonder what new vehicle content we may be receiving over the next year. The Scorpion is combat-focused, with an anti-air and anti-vehicle bias. The Scarab, while effective at fighting infantry, is exploration-focused. Among combat-focused SRVs, there's still a lot of room for further specialization. A dedicated anti-ship surface vehicle, with focus on medium and large vessels, would be a good logical step. There is also room for a dedicated anti-infantry combat vehicle. Depending on how far Frontier plans to take this, I could see the fighter hangar being repurposed to double as a larger vehicle hangar, and bringing with it a suite of larger, more diverse vehicles for different applications and scenarios. It would be great if we as commanders could deploy our own skimmers in ground fights, whether AI-controlled or directly piloted. If ground environments evolve enough for caves, the SRV will gain even more relevance, as will opportunities for archaeology, exploration, and mining, with dedicated vehicles possible for each role. Though I imagine this will happen on a timescale of years, if it happens at all. If the Scarab is meant for general exploration and light combat, what would a dedicated exploration SRV look like? Or a dedicated material grinder? Or a dedicated salvager? I'd be interested to see the community sentiment about where ground vehicles should go next. Share your thoughts in the comments. That's all I've got for today, Commanders, so I'll catch you all later.